Hi, and welcome to episode number 54 of the weekly Google Cloud Platform podcast. I am Francesca Ampoi, and I'm here with my colleague, Mark Mandel. Hey, Mark, how are you doing? I am doing pretty well. How are you doing, Francesca? Pretty good, pretty good. A uh, very busy day with lots of podcasting actually today, but uh, very excited about uh, having actually someone completely new. He's a Noogler, I'm going to say. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, he's been working at Google uh, for two weeks, but actually mostly like two days. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and he, he just joined after Google acquired... Um, Apigee. Apigee. That's, yeah. that's the name. I totally forgot that name. Yeah. Yeah, uh, so we're going to be talking about what is what is an API and what is the API lifecycle. And uh, it's a very interesting conversation. He's been doing this for quite a while, so he has a lot of insights on yeah. what you should be looking at when you expose your API to and the world. And it's more than you might think. Oh, yeah, there's a lot of things. There's a lot of stuff. Yeah, um, yeah it is not just like, oh, you should use, you should use HTTPS, which you should. Yep. It's way more than that. So very interesting conversation. Yeah, and after that, we have a lovely extension from the conversation we had with us last week, uh, talking a little bit more about Ruby, um, yeah. talking about how you can interact with, say, Google Cloud Services, but with an API and a set of libraries that allow you to not have vendor lock-in. So you could like move it to another cloud provider if you so desired. Yeah, very, very interesting. Actually, it makes me uh, wish we had something like that for Go. Ooh. Yeah, I wonder if there is. We should check it out. We should. But before we get into uh, all of those topics, we have a cool thing of the week, uh, which is brought by yourself, Mark. Uh, it is. It is. Yeah. It's brought by me. Um, yeah. Yes, I brought it um, by reading blogs. <laughs> hey, Good job. It's that kind of day. So uh, recently on the Kubernetes blog, there is a really cool tool uh, called Compose. Uh, that was a great alliteration. Uh, Compose <laughs> with a K. Um, so if anyone who has worked with Docker before, quite often people, um, they start working with Docker and that's cool and that's great. And then they often quote a Docker Compose when they have multiple containers they want to work with and have them work together. And a question I see quite often in the community is, oh, I've got this Compose thing, but then I want to go to Kubernetes, and I know about Compose, but I don't know about Kubernetes. What do I do? I don't know. Um, and so this is actually an open source tool that lets you take Docker Compose um, as well as a Docker DAB file or a dis Docker distributed application bundle. Um, and then you can convert it into Kubernetes deployments and services uh, using this command line tool, either to push it uh, directly up to... Um, Kubernetes master? Yeah, or actually just create the files themselves and then you can edit them as you see fit. Cool, that, that is pretty nice. So basically it is uh, like a one, uh, one-off thing. Like you have a big Compose uh, file that you spend a lot of time building and rather than having to do manually, just use that and boom, done. Yeah, then you're good to go. I think it's a really nice little way of learning about like containers and sort of extending it them further uh, into into different things. And then also, like if you're doing a compare and contrast against Swarm versus like Kubernetes, it's yeah. an easy way to bounce between the both as well. That is very cool. Cool. So I think it's time to go talk with uh, our new coworker, Anna Ho. Let's go do that. So I'm very happy to welcome Alan Ho to the podcast. Uh, hi, Alan. How are you doing? Doing well. So very excited because uh, you're actually the first person that we interview that uh, comes from RPG. Uh You were a lead developer uh, for advocacy for RPG. That's right. Yeah. Could you tell us a little bit more about what you do? Uh, so kind of my, my main job is to help our customers uh, essentially build better APIs. Uh, so I do a lot of, um, uh, I work with developers, I also work with uh, not just developers, but also architects to build their API programs um, and uh, help build better APIs, uh, give them some tips and consulting, help them with the product. And I give a lot of feedback to our own product team about the usage of Apigee. And I believe this is your second day at Google, is that right? Uh, well, technically, this is my second week at Google. So we onboarded uh, last Wednesday, but I was uh, out at, a, at an API conference uh, last week right after we onboarded in Chicago. So uh, second day in the Venice office. <laughs> nice. Being Venice, uh, the one in Los Angeles, not Venice, Italy. No, the one in Los Angeles, oh, you're right. It's less fancy. It's still pretty <laughs> cool, though. <laughs> nice. So uh, we've said the word API, well, the words, the, the letters API many, many times already. Uh, why don't you give us your definition of what an API is? Yeah, well, uh, you know, an API is an application programming interface 
Uh, but you know, today, I mean, there's a lot of application. I mean, we've been had APIs forever. Uh, but today, when we say APIs, we we usually specifically refer to web APIs, uh, web APIs hosted in the cloud or within your own uh, data center. Um, and so, you know, I think there's there's nothing there. You know, APIs. Probably the better question to ask is like, uh, not what is an API, but rather. What makes a good API versus a bad API? I then answer that question. Yeah, what, what does make a good API versus <laughs> a totally, bad API? We're totally happy with that. Different <laughs> question too. Yeah, I think I think like the, the the primary difference is kind of your mindset. Um, so there's the mindset for a lot of developers when they create APIs. They think about just exposing their interface, their application through a uh, you know HTTP interface. That's one way to think about it. But good APIs think more about the consumer. They, they think about it as what's the easiest way that a consumer can derive value from the application I built. Um, and when I say the easiest way, that means there's, there's a lot of things that are necessary to happen. It's not just, you know, throw an, uh, throw on a interface and, you know, have a PDF to, uh, let you code against it. Uh, but there's a lot of kind of like, uh, different steps you need to take. Uh, for for building an API, but you know, you know, I want I want to turn it around. Like, how does uh, GCP think about APIs and uh, what makes a good API for GCP standpoint? Uh, that's a very good question. I'd say that you know it's something that empowers our customers to do whatever they need in the easiest and most efficient way. I think that that is maybe a decent definition. I don't know what do you think, Mark. I think you gave a very good answer, Francesc. Okay. I was, <laughs> and that was not even prepared. <laughs> <Yeah>. that. <laughs> yeah, so I think that uh, what, you're, what you were pointing at is like it's, it is not just about giving a way to access our services. Uh, like, because otherwise, you know, a f f doing phone calls could be also an API somehow. <laughs> <laughs> That's <laughs> right. <laughs> it is really as making it as efficient as possible. I think they should bring back fax machines. I think that's... Oh yeah, that's yeah, what I'm that's waiting for. Definitely a good idea. That's what I, that's how I'm going to build my API interfaces from now on. <laughs> so so now that we have a, a kind of a good definition and idea of what a, a good API is, uh, let's talk about why. Uh, why would a company create an API? Yeah, you know, there's there's actually um, you know multiple there's multi I would say stages of value that a company can create an API. I mean the first for the first reason is um, you know a lot of companies are now building their software actually as microservices, right? And all microservices communicate via API. So any any company that's building a microservice today is essentially building an API. And that's kind of like the lowest level of value, in my opinion, because it's just, it's all about making sure that you create these, um, you know, uh, you know, connected applications and let teams not have to work on one big monolithic application. Uh, so maybe that's the lowest level. The second level of companies who are making APIs is that they want to expose their, their software as a product, right? Uh, so, you know, so basically, you know, especially if you want to create a developer, if you want to create a, if you, if you have a core value proposition, uh, and you need to enable developers to build on top of it, they expose it to the product. And the classic example is mobile apps, right? Uh, today, if you have a mobile app, it talks through an API. It's not hitting, it's not hitting, uh, it's not, it's not a, it's, it's usually not a web page. And even if it is a web page, it's usually a single page app. So they're calling APIs. So really you need, you need APIs so that you could have potentially a variety of clients or front ends to be able to access the information that your business or your service kind of provides. Would that Correct. Accurate? Yeah. That's a very, it's, a, it sounds, it sounds simplistic, but, uh, that, that is the case. And I think the, the highest form of APIs, though, is more building an ecosystem. For example, Walgreens, um, you know, a lot of people know Walgreens is a place where they can pick up drugs or print out pictures. Um, so what they found is that when people go pick up a picture, they end up doing other things, like they buy, uh, you know, they buy some chips or they, they um, you know, they might buy a toy or do some grocery shopping, things of that sort. In fact, they found people who does something on the web and mobile and then come into the store to do something have almost a 6x 
increase in the uh, amount of uh, uh, revenue that they, they spend per store visit. So it becomes an advantage to have as many, uh, you know, as much uh, usage of, uh, of mobile prior to going into the store. So what they did is that they opened up their API to all these um, photo apps. You know, there's tons of photo apps out there. Uh, uh, and what they let you do is they allow people to print their photos straight from these photo apps in the store and pick it up in the store. So that way they drive a lot of foot traffic and they have an ecosystem of applications that are uh, driving this foot traffic into the store. So there's, there's multiple, you know, kind of levels of uh, uh, reasons and business reasons why you can use APIs. Uh, and it just, it just all matters on which particular use case and what drives the most business value. Cool. So uh, as soon as you start doing things like this, though, uh, where you're exposing your API to the world, there's a bunch of things that you're going to need to start handling, like security, but also like quotas. And I mean, someone's going to need to pay for those pictures. <laughs> how yeah. do you manage? How do you manage those things? Well, um, so, you know, you know, as we talk about like uh, application development life cycles, right? Um, there in a similar way, there's what we call an API life cycle. Um, and I'll kind of, I'll step through kind of the, uh, it's, and it's a fairly, it's, uh, there are probably eight ma major steps of uh, doing development. Um, and feel free, if, if uh, you've got questions, feel free to interrupt me. Um, and those steps kind of break down to design, develop, securing your API, publishing your API, scaling it, uh, monitoring it. Uh, analyzing the people who use the API, and last but not least, monetizing your API. And so, you know, for each of these steps, um, there's, uh, you know, there's, there's going to be a, uh, a set of other tasks to do. So, for example, when you're creating your API, uh, sorry, when you're first designing your API, uh, what we recommend is that you start sharing the design of your API with your consumers as quickly as possible. Um, you know, one of the, uh, the, one of the very popular standard is, uh, Swagger, uh, mm -hmm. which has now been rebranded to Open API. Um, you know, that's a very, very easy way and a language agnostic way to actually understand whether people like your API in the first place. So getting customers to actually, you know, having design, making sure you have the tools to circulate that and co-edit those APIs, um, almost like you're editing a Google Doc. Uh, is going to be a, a very, very important for making sure your API is consumable. And then the next step of that is that when you're developing your APIs, I'm not talking about developing the application logic, but your actual APIs, there's a lot of things you also need to do too. So for example, if your backend so happens to be a, uh, you know, an old school SOAP uh, service, you know, you may want to create an API uh, with, uh, you know, out of the box, uh, use some way to convert like SOAP to REST, right? Um, and especially if you have more complicated use cases, you might actually have to like use JavaScript or Node or something of that sort to, you know, uh, to, to facade your existing backend. Uh, then the next step of that would be to secure your API. So we're talking about like having OAuth, uh, you know, SSL, uh, putting in some, uh, what I call, uh, you know, threat protection for like detecting, you know, SQL injection script, uh, attacks, things of that sort. Um, one of the things that people don't realize with APIs is that unlike web pages, uh, you can leak a lot more data through an API than a web page. Uh, the other, the, the issue about, uh, and a lot of, a lot of times when people develop their APIs, they try to develop their APIs for as many consumers as possible. So the, 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 they end up like returning lots and lots of information through the API, which is like, a, is a very, very bad practice. So, you know, making sure your API is stripping out things that are sensitive, uh, things that the customer really doesn't need, uh, becomes a very important insecurity. And last but not least, like today, you know, we've have, we got a lot of denial of service bots out there or, or, uh, bots that scrape websites, uh, you know, bots are now getting smart to the point that they can scrape the APIs themselves. So being able to detect uh, what we call low and slow attacks 
and then doing things like uh, honey pots so that you can direct you know people to a fake API you know a mock API instead of your real data becomes uh, really important from a security standpoint so it sounds like there's a bit of a balancing act there too because obviously if you've got say an ecosystem that you're building and you want people to come and use your apis you kind of want to expose as much as possible but on the flip side you don't want to expose anything that may be sensitive or harmful how do you kind of combat that or or at least find that that right level of of the sweet spot of where that could be um I, so that's where it's kind of like what i would actually do is i would look at the particular use case so um, you might have an API that might have uh, might be used in a B two B scenario, right? One ser- like a server calling that API, or it might be used directly by a mobile app. In those scenarios, what I would personally recommend is that you split out, uh, you split them into two different APIs, right? The one for the mobile app might have uh, less. Uh, you know, less information, and it would be definitely protected by OAuth. And then the one that's meant to be called from a server, it might include, it might have a different authentication authorization mechanism and serve more data through it. So my kind of recommendation is that if you have like multiple use cases uh, that are very, very different, uh, that serves different information, don't try to jam it all into one API, uh, but rather have multiple APIs. Now remember, just because you have multiple APIs doesn't mean that you can't still have one implementation. It just means creating multiple facades on the same uh, backend system. Cool. Cool. There's a question that uh, I've got a couple times, and since you're here, I wonder if you could uh, answer it, which is, let's imagine that you want to have your API available to the world, and uh, you have an interest on as many people as possible using it, but you have ter- terms of service. Uh, how do you make sure that only the people that have agreed to terms of services or things like that, people that are not doing something uh, that you consider as abuse of your API have access to it? What, what yeah. are the kind of techniques that you would recommend for that? Uh, so, I mean, the, if you go to most cloud providers, you know, they, you know, they, have, they basically have different quota limits uh, for each, uh, each user, right? So first thing you want to do, like if you want to expose to the world, like number one thing to do is create a portal, a developer portal, where people can, in a self-service way, you know, get API keys. And when they sign up for these API keys, you can assign different uh, quota limits for each of the, for, depending on what their, uh, what service they're signing up for. Uh, and then in within the gate, within a, a gateway, this is kind of the this is a purpose of why you would want to have a gateway in front, of, in front of your APIs. The gateway would be able to do counting and making sure that people uh, don't exceed their particular limits. Cool. Uh, so I think I interrupted you in the middle of the API lifecycle. So uh, we're talking about how to secure an API. Uh, what would be the next step? So, um, yeah, so after you secure your API, uh, you would publish it uh, so that the world can see it. Mm-hmm. Uh, and in publishing an API, uh, a lot of times, like, uh, people say, oh, I just need to publish the API and developer portal if I have a public API. Well, the truth is, even if your API is only being used within your own company, uh, it's probably a good idea to publish it so that people within your own company are not kind of reinventing the wheel. Um, it's also really important to have some sort of, you know, issue developer keys even within the, within your own org. So that you know, you know who within the company is using your APIs, uh, and allows you to communicate to those people when the APIs are going to change or deprecated. Uh, and last but not least, you need that for uh, chargebacks as well. Yeah, so that sounds interesting as well. Does the now I, I don't know a huge amount of swagger about Open API, but does that sort of help with that process of being able to communicate about what's published and what's not published and how those things work? Yeah, so Swagger is, uh, the, the great thing about Swagger is that after you define your model uh, and you, you, you define your APIs, you can actually annotate your Swagger document and put the documentation within Swagger itself. Uh, and what it'll do is that, you know, you can use uh, uh, Swagger uh, editors to generate the documentation, like live, uh, live interactive documentation. Cool. So instead of just having like a PDF file, you know, you can actually create, um, you can create a uh, live, uh, you know, testable uh, UI that you can actually, you know, essentially kind of like do curl commands 
and it will give you the actual results. So after publishing, um, then the next thing you need to do is scale your API. Uh, and what there's, you know, there's multiple, you know, uh, from a scalability standpoint, if your API is being called from many, many clients around the world, uh, you need to make sure that uh, that you have uh, almost like a CDN, you have points of presence uh, in many, many different data centers all around the world, especially cl as close as possible to the consuming client. Uh, so, you know, we have, uh, Apigee has uh, many, many data, uh, depending on what kind of service, uh, use the on-prem version uh, or the cloud version, you know, we're, di we're geo-distributed in lots of uh, data centers, uh, and we're going to also be moving on, uh, you know, not just uh, in our main one that we use is Amazon Web Services, but in the future, we're gonna obviously going to be doing Google Cloud and other cloud platform providers out there, too. Um, the other thing, too, is that, you know, from a scaling standpoint, uh, it's also really important to remember that you can put things like caching uh, in your gateway, which will reduce a lot of the API calls to your very back-end systems, uh, and that could drastically reduce the cost that you need to scale your system. Makes sense. Uh, and then after you've kind of scaled the system, the next thing is you've got to make sure the thing doesn't fall over. So hmm. having all the dashboards, uh, you know, application performance monitoring dashboards uh, and logging dashboards becomes really important. And one of the things I tell people is that, like, yes, you might have logging and application performance monitoring on your app, but if you have monitoring and logging at the application uh, interface, uh, at the API layer, it actually gives you a much better sense of what the customer is actually experiencing. So having kind of like, you know, monitoring at that layer, not at the application layer, but for the programming interface layer, uh, it helps you quickly diagnose whether your customers are having a uh, poor um you know, uh, poor, you know, uh, S are, are meeting their SLAs, uh, things of that sort. Because, you know, your application is somewhat, ag like, it doesn't understand which particular users are using that API, nor does it understand this, uh, the level of the, the SLA that they have promised the user. But the API tier does understand that. So that's where it becomes very valuable. Uh, and then two more steps, just two more. Uh, <laughs> after you make sure that you're at, your, your thing is, uh, your, your API is stable and it's meeting its SLAs, then you got to figure out who's who's actually using your API. So, uh, you know, when you're creating these uh, APIs, you want to figure. It's almost like a funnel. You know, developers. You know, a lot of times developers would you know log, you know sign up for the API, and then maybe you know, thirty or forty percent of them might actually send an API call, and then of that, another maybe ten percent might actually um, uh, use your API on a regular basis. And just understanding the, those steps become very important because, you know, as cust as developers are using your fun uh, going down this uh, what I call the developer funnel, you may want to engage them in a different way. So for the people who have used your API, there's actually kind of a magic um, at off point. We found that developers use your APIs for three weeks. They maybe not sending traffic every day, but they've been they use your tra your API for three weeks you see that the engagement of that user and the propensity for them to buy the product is way, way higher. So kind of understanding who's using your APIs and targeting them in a the right way becomes uh, really important. Just a quick question. Uh, when you say who's using those APIs, do you mean specifically like which applications are using those APIs or actually like which possible customers through those applications are using those APIs? Uh, both. Okay. Both. Yeah. So... You know, you may want to see, you know, are iOS applications using me more or Android applications using me more? Uh, you know, those you might want to, you know, segment your applications by, you know, the type of app. Uh, but then you might want to support, you want, might want to like slice and dice between the types of companies that are using it. So is it a, uh, you know, a startup developer, right? Uh, or is it a large enterprise? All right, like a large enterprise, they're very likely to pay you a lot more money. Uh, but if it's a startup developer for a heart startup, you still may want to engage them because they can provide you a lot of great free press for your, uh, for your APIs. So you understanding who is using your API is, becomes critically important for learning how to engage those customers.
Cool. So I think that there, you mentioned there was a one last <laughs> yeah, one last one is you got to make money, right? Profit. <laughs> right, profit, exactly. <laughs> um, you know, so being able to, you know, charge people's credit cards for, uh, you know, the simple way of thinking about monetization is like the Amazon Web Services way. You charge per API call. Uh, but the reality is, you know, when you talk about these API ecosystems, um, for example, Walgreens, they don't charge for their API at all. Right, because they they uh, they are incur they want people to use their API so that um, you know more people come into the store and spend more money. So instead, they might have like internal chargeback mechanisms uh, to charge other business divisions uh, whenever their APIs are being used. So there's 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 multiple like when you think about monetization, you know, you need to think about you know directly monetizing it. Uh, indirectly monetizing it or kind of like internal chargebacks within your organization. Cool. So that, yeah, that's, that's the life cycle. <laughs> so that, that seems like there's a lot of uh, things that you should take into account whenever you're going to publish an API, uh, which I guess why that, that's the reason why IPG exists at all. <laughs> <Yeah>. So, <laughs> so uh, I was wondering if you could give us a like pretty high view of how does it look to go through this API lifecycle uh, using Apigee? Yeah, so, um, you know, we have, um, Apigee has, uh, is an API management platform that, I mean, our goal is to make it very, make it very fast for you to kind of get through this lifecycle. Because I just didn't, I, I, I just rattled off a ton, a ton of steps. Um, but the way, the way that we do it is that, you know, um, we provide design tools. So we have a swagger editor, uh, an, uh, a swagger slash open API editor mm -hmm. that we've contributed from an open source standpoint. Uh, but we also have it built into our product. So we encourage people to create their API design, uh, then load their APIs, uh, then proxy their APIs through, uh, Apigee's gateway. Uh, and that, you know, provides you the ability to add security, monitoring, uh, analysis on top of it. Uh, and then we allow people to uh, publish developer portals uh, in a turnkey fashion uh, so that you don't have to, you know, mess around with Drupal or, or your own CMS system. Uh, and then, you know, we have out-of-box connectors for monetization. So whether it's some, like, uh, uh, you know, payment providers uh, things of that sort, uh, we make it just, we just accelerate it and we provide all the connectors for you to make it, uh, stand up your API program as quickly as possible. Awesome. Um, I think we'll definitely get you back, uh, to do a more in-depth analysis of exactly what Epigee can do in the API space. But, uh, since we're running out of time, uh, some final questions. I wanted to ask, what's the, uh, coolest or your favorite, what's the, like, most interesting API you've come across in, in all your time working with APIs? Oh, uh, <laughs> It's the coolest API. Um, I would say re very recently the Uber APIs are the most interesting. Um, the Uber API, like Uber provides um, APIs uh, so that, you know, you can call a cab from anywhere, right? Uh, and this allows you to, uh, they actually do multiple things. They allow you to, like, call... They have an API to pick up anybody or anything and deliver it to somewhere else, right? And, and that, that drastically changes how local commerce is done because, you know, when you create a store and things of that sort, there's automatic assumption of how, how f you create stores based on how far, you know, it takes to drive there or the reach of the store. And suddenly when you have an API that lets you deliver almost anything to anywhere within a, high, uh, within a city in less than 30 minutes, you drastically increase the, uh, you know, your, uh, you, you drastically change how stores should be thought about and how you, how you can connect with customers. And they also have cool APIs too that even if you're in an Uber and going to the store, you know, you can monitor what every single person is doing. And then, you know, assuming you got, you, the user gives permission and, you know, even let them know about products that you're uh, about to see or you go before you get into the store itself. So they've kind of like created this end-to-end -end trip experience, um, which is really going to change how people build apps, uh, as well as how people actually, how potentially how cities can be arranged uh, uh, for you know shopping, 
as well as living. So I think that is the probably the most game-changing API that I've kind of worked with so far. Cool. And you know, you can go on on Apogee uh, blog to uh, we had I had a, a webcast uh, with their Chris Messina, the guy who used to work at Google and invented the cash tag. Uh, and he goes through all of those uh, cool use cases. Cool. We'll have a link to that on the show notes as, as usual. Awesome. All right. Uh, before we finish up, is there anything interesting or anything we haven't managed to cover that you want to talk about before we uh, wrap things up here? Make APIs great again. <laughs> Just joking. Uh, no, that like, build great APIs. If you have any questions, you can. I'm always available via Twitter. Uh, and uh, you can also, we'll also have some show notes and, you know, get a hold of me. Thank you. Cool. We'll have a link to uh, to your Twitter from the show notes if anyone wants to contact you. Great. Thank you so much. Take care. Thanks. Thanks again to Alan for joining us today. A uh, very interesting conversation, more at a sort of higher level about APIs, but I think that's really, really good and really interesting. Just a lot of things to sort of consider and talk about when building APIs uh, for services and people to use. Yeah, I think that this uh, this is going to be a good reference episode that we might be able to uh, use as a table of contents of yep. topics to cover in more depth. Because every single one of those steps he mentioned in the uh, API lifecycle, I think deserve an episode. <laughs> so yeah, they could definitely <laughs> be, be there in yeah. an episode. Great. So let's go with the question of the week. And the question of the week today uh, comes from, um, not from Aja, but the, the answer comes from Aja. Yeah. And the question is, uh, okay, so let's imagine that I'm building this application and I want to use some cloud provider. Mm -hmm. So let's say that uh, I'm currently using um, storage, uh, so S3 on Amazon, mm -hmm. and, and I'm considering moving to Google Cloud storage at some point. Is there any way that I can run my code against an API or a library that will abstract the detail of what is the cloud provider? So then the migration would be easier. Yeah, so I think this is really cool. So actually, Aja, who was on the episode last week, uh, does a Cloud Minute video on covering exactly this with storage specifically. Um, but there's a great Ruby library called Fog um, that literally does exactly what you're talking about. It acts as an abstraction to a variety, a quite a wide variety of cloud providers uh, through compute, DNS, storage, and several other services that are commonly available across cloud providers. Um, and what makes this really, really powerful is, yeah, I could be running on, say, AWS, interacting with S3. I work against the API. And then if I want to be like, oh, let's see how this works on Google Cloud Storage. Maybe it's better. Maybe it's worse. Let's let's find out. All I need to do is basically change my provider with this, like my authentic authentication mm -hmm. details, credentials, et cetera. And then I'm good to go. I don't have to change my code. I can just push up, you know, stuff up into Google Cloud Storage or whatever it is I'm working with. And then I, you know, can keep on moving on from there. It is very cool. I, I was checking now the list of providers they have. And it is like it is more than the all the cloud providers I know. <laughs> it is crazy. <laughs> There's like 30 of them. It is pretty amazing. Uh, so whatever it is that you might be considering using, I think it's a good idea if you're writing Ruby to go check it out and have an idea of what kind of uh, APIs you could use across any provider. Yeah, cool. So Frances, thanks again for uh, hanging out with me. Are you doing anything special? I know we have our team offsite coming up. Yeah, so currently, if everything went fine, uh, by the time this episode is out, I'm currently uh, hanging out in Shanghai. Nice. Yeah, uh, so pretty excited about that. Uh, holidays, basically. And after that, back to the United States to have an offsite with the whole team uh, in Los Angeles. Excellent. So I guess I'll see you there. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I will be there. Uh, that's where I will be next week, uh, or a week after that, I should say, as well. Um, I'm just going to be kind of hanging out around San Francisco. Things are winding down for the rest of the year. So Cool. And then get ready for next year where I'm actually just to give a little, uh, a very short list of things, of places I'm going to be. I will be at Golab IO in Florence. Then I'll go to Fosdem in Brussels. Then I go to GopherCon, India. And... I think that that's it for now. That's up to February. So, yeah. <laughs> that's that's pretty good. All I'm really concerned about is like uh, next and uh, GDC. Oh, yes. That's in February. Yeah. Okay. That's going to be fun. So, yeah. yeah. Busy, busy year yeah. next year. But for now, for this year, pretty calm. Yeah. Very excited about not doing much. <laughs> Excellent. Well, like I said before, thank you so much for joining me for yet another week. Have a wonderful trip and uh, we'll see you all next week. Thank you. And yeah, see you all next week. 